Sajudarzu Lasso, so before uh, starting to listen to the explanations, please generate the body mind, uh, the intention uh, to guide all sentient beings in number as vast as the sky uh, to Buddha the enlightened state. Mm mm so in the previous uh, session we came uh, to the end of the section of this text which explains uh, about um, the absolute perspective of the body mind uh, both in terms of uh, meditation and post meditation uh, and how uh, afflictive obscuring states of mind are counteracted uh, in terms of uh, both meditation and post meditation tandi phartu jasel an sodem ke so <coughs> the text uh, which sets forth uh, the 37 practices of a bodhisattva uh, begins with an introductory part uh, as well as uh, uh, quite some detailed explanations as to what the body mind is about. Uh, 
followed by uh, explaining the various stages of so-called mind training, which a beginner uh, practitioner uh, starts out his path with. That is then followed by explanations regarding the absolute perspective of the Bodhi mind. Of course, in terms of beginner practitioners, uh, these explanations will help the practitioner to acquire knowledge of what the absolute perspective of the Bodhi mind is. And by way of that knowledge, how one as a practitioner can counteract afflictive obscuring states. Of course, uh, in terms of beginner practitioners, uh, a direct realization of the absolute perspective isn't possible to begin with, so one starts with acquiring an understanding of the absolute uh, perspective. Uh, and how one can possibly uh, counteract afflictive, obscuring states of mind by way of one's level of understanding and knowledge. So, so, in terms of the absolute perspective uh, of the Bodhi mind in the context of beginner practitioners, what is at hand is how a beginner practitioner can train his mind in terms of the uh, uh, absolute perspective. Uh, as the beginner practitioner evidently has no direct realization of that perspective. So the, the path explained till now uh, is explained or has been explained, the path of a bodhisattva, in the context of so-called mind training for the benefit of beginner practitioners. Uh, so, um, a few people have uh, sent in some questions, and Cameroon will start this session by answering those questions. <clears throat> the first question is Apparent phenomena, all of them, are fabrications of the mind. Uh, so, that's a, a quotation from one of the verses of the last session. And the question is, is it correct to say that there are no objects out there floating around independently waiting for me to perceive them? Yet phenomena do still <coughs> persist. <coughs> Mountains do not crumble the neighboring house doesn't collapse just because nobody is perceiving them. Uh, no mind may be occupied with these phenomena. So in spite of that, uh, what follows? Uh, well, what was said is that the mind is not a creator. Uh, is this a correct conclusion at this point? I understand that it's due to causes and conditions that mountains have appeared, houses have been constructed, and that we as human beings have specific mental patterns as to how we perceive the outer world. Houses as places to live in, mountains as part of a landscape, and so on. My mind is carrying these habitual patterns specific for human beings. 
getting to know of objects happens in my mind. Other than mind, there is no place for objects to appear. Follows, there is no outer world. Uh, normally, I see the world as outer and other than me. If the distinction between me and outer phenomena is a fabrication, if I think of that phrase, I don't know what to think, what to feel. Okay, that 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 the problem the that Joan the Nala face a jatra kashe lepsas. Then I ne young ne young to lean pu devi. Then the carrier into sida carrier is na nganso um nongwa sige de tangbo nongwa sige de chasi chana ro 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 ke simju do yebe. Let's Kiri Redua. De Tandagi Ketia Marva, ne de Marava Tanda. Coranchi Luyo da Megi, Trivagi, Delche Marva. Nangwa Kareyi Nayang Narangla Tatanchi Yongi Orava, Legi Bakshalatene. Ne de Remato. Nangwa de chilo yo da megi kecha marava. Ya, dan derwa. Triva trigin de gi chilo yo da me trigin wa. Ah, pena ngaran sharbe pasha gitnwa te. Ya. Ye simting pasha de mato shiro to yama de. Re. Ngaran lenang de. Lenang de. Dan de kare cha de. Ye ne mo ku koran chilo yo da me. Ngopotishi Go put the main thing in the same passage sharp with the one. Ray, you need Lasso. You need to go to Chilo Yoda, make a cake, check or a maravatanda. Marimara, may consult a cogan do she? Yeah. Chilo Yoda may de la todo gendua. Make a cake, ya maravatanda. Tanda ne cora, drell she cora. And the carriage of the Versena. No matter, can't get simply no more. Say one matto. No, you did. You had to make a catch a marva. She said, No, she. Well, let's clarify one thing. This, this kind of question is very frequent. Kemper Impish says he's been asked this question hundreds of times. And there appear to be a basic misunderstanding in terms of what is discussed. Uh, the explanations are not about whether there are or there are not things out there. The question is, sorry, the topic discussed isn't uh, whether the things you know uh, exist out there or not, have an outer existence or not. That's not the point at all here. It's not even discussed whether you have an outer world and an, uh, and an inner world, the inner world being your mind, and how your mind, or what the contents of your mind is. 
and that the contact, contents of your mind have an inner existence, uh, whereas the objects your mind know have an outer. This is not discussed at all. Uh, what, what is discussed and explained is whether your ideas, uh, your way of seeing things, uh, accords with the true nature of reality, both in terms of your mindset and in terms of the objects your mind uh, knows. But it's not... The, the explanations are not about outer versus inner, not at all. Uh, so it's not a question of whether or not things disappear when you do not see them, that sounds disappear when you do not hear them. This is of no interest here. Uh, what is explained is that sentient beings see objects of knowledge in various ways depending upon the predispositions uh, they have within their minds. And here there is a great variation in terms of how we see how we understand how one's mind is conditioned uh, because of habits uh, as to uh, behavior in previous lives, behavior and uh, actions committed in previous lives. Uh, so the discussion is rather about uh, the way different beings perceive, see, know, non-conceptually as well as conceptually, various objects of knowledge, and whether or not their knowledge of those objects uh, is correct or incorrect, valid or not valid, in terms of what uh, they have understood about something, or how they see something, the idea they have on, of something. What happens in terms of uh, both non-conceptual and conceptual processes in relation to an object of knowledge is that the mind uh, perceives the object and then gives it a name and then develops um, an idea of what the object is. And here, in terms of the worldly mindset, uh, the conclusions drawn by the perceiver are not valid in terms of what the object in fact is. Because any object is made up of innumerable parts. If we take a, a visual object, uh, it's made up of innumerable um, particles material particles, and each particle, uh, down to the tiniest uh, atoms and subatomic particles, can be divided into yet smaller and smaller units in an infinite progression. Therefore, the object known or perceived does not exist the way we believe it exists, namely as a visual object uh, that is a whole and that has a reality of its own. Having said that, doesn't mean that 
things just disappear into a nothing. It means simply that our perception of the object does not accord with what the object in fact is, because we don't see the fact that the object we're dealing with has no real reality, because uh, it's made up of innumerable subtle material particles that can be divided into yet smaller and smaller units in an infinite progression. We don't see that. And that is the truth about the object. It is empty of a real reality, and we don't see that. We see a flower with colors, which we believe has a real reality, for example. So it's not a matter of whether the flower is there or not that's discussed. The, the crucial point as to this whole debate and the phrase apparent phenomena, all of them are fabrications of the mind, is to point to the fact that what we believe is there isn't there. But it doesn't mean that there is just a vacuum, nothing. And if we don't see the flower, uh, it sort of evaporates and is no more. That's not the point at all. Tessida. Nangjiri chirbe ngue potela rawa. Korangge rangge ngo daku jeb tuyaj mindu ba. Den jeb tu. Teb masae kechi chere chindung gahan rong doa. Nangjiri chirbe ngue po sungge noga. Nangjiri chirba te da dultren den sungko. Yeah yeah dultren den sungko. Yes. So it should now be clear that. Anything, whether a visual object, a sound, or otherwise, is made up of very, very subtle material particles. So these particles collecting together uh, makes for a basis in dependence upon which so-called objects of knowledge come to be. But the object of knowledge, uh, which is merely the collection of innumer a collection of innumerable such particles, has no real reality. Why? Simply because each of the particles can be divided into yet smaller and smaller units in an infinite progression. Therefore, there isn't a yellow flower with green leaves, which we believe that there is. It isn't really. We have the wrong idea about the thing we see. We don't see its actual nature, that of being empty of a real reality. And the subtle material particles, uh, the building blocks of that flower, as it were, uh, are in a process of constant change. So what do we actually see? Uh, if, if one were to sort of give a name to what is actually there, impermanence, emptiness. However, the point made here is that we fail to see that as regular worldly individuals. We see a yellow flower with green leaves, uh, which we believe has a real reality. So that's the point. The point isn't whether the things are there or not there. Hmm. Pen the shivy na. Pen the jam so shindo tangwa chila. Ta pen the Hawaii jaso na wichil tuwe tarwa. Mo tenge yarwa. Mhm. Ten garan so ge mo mo du se grawa. Mhm. Ta yena ya mo mo se kin sondo niyeg marwa. 
So, uh, another example would be uh, the blue ocean waters, clear blue ocean waters uh, example. Um, uh, if you've ever been to the island of Hawaii, you would have seen what we call the clear blue ocean waters on the shores of that island. Uh, however, if you uh, go up to the waterfront and scoop up the clear blue ocean water with your uh, hand, if you look into the hand, the water no longer has a blue color. Why? <laughs> because the ocean waters are not blue, even though we believe so. Uh, they, the ocean waters appear to have this color because of various atmospheric conditions, but it's transparent, in fact. Just clear water. It, there is no color. So, the point is that the way we perceive each and everything is mistaken, has nothing to do with what is in fact the case about the things we see here and so on. Uh, the discussion or the explanations are not about whether the things are there or not in an outer world. It's not at all the point. However, as worldly in individuals, uh, we have throughout innumerable uh, lifetimes accumulated what is called predispositions. We are predisposed as human beings to see uh, things in a certain way. Uh, animals are predisposed in terms of how they see things uh, their way. Uh, point made, the way we see things, the way we understand things, originate with those predispositions which are about mistaken knowledge mm. as to what the things we see here and so on in fact are. That dancing number to take a karate ubidos at another day, polum to karate gears and then you munchy ubidoa. And the common denominator of all predispositions is uh, that. The way we see them, the way we know them, the various objects of knowledge, uh, is that the belief that they are real, that they truly exist in terms of how we see them. We, we do believe that the ocean waters are blue till someone points out to us, no. We believe that the yellow flower with green leaves is real until it is, is explained to us to the point where we do understand that our perception or knowledge of the flower is mistaken in terms of what the so-called flower in fact is. Uh, so, we're predisposed, as worldly individuals, to see things as real, to see a real reality where there is none. And what happens once you're trapped in that belief system? Well, the next thing that happens is likes and dislikes, the arising of afflictive obscuring states. Then, 
Pashala tenangal numaji sharimut. So if one in brief looks uh, at this process, the mental process, which is about um, knowing an object of knowledge, whatever the object may be. Uh, to begin with, the mind simply registers the presence of something. Uh, and uh, that initial phase of a person knowing an object is non-conceptual. Uh, the, the registering of the presence of something simply without having attached a name to the something or identified it by way of color and so on, not at all. To begin with, the mind simply non-conceptually registers the presence of something. Uh, which is followed by uh, the idea that the thing one is in contact with is real. So here we've come to, come to the se uh, second of the many phases of any process of perception, where the mind uh, <coughs> attaches, where the worldly mindset attaches a real reality uh, to the thing in question. Uh, followed by uh, a very subtle type of attachment which makes for wanting to interact with the object in, in question. So uh, attachment here could be about wanting to continue to um, inter or attachment here is wanting to continue the interaction with the object. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not about wanting the object yet or wanting to reject the object because one dislikes it. Uh, it's a more subtle type of attachment which makes for just wanting to continue to be in contact with the object. Then, this segment And that then escalates and uh, the attachment manifests on a much more gross level. Uh, and here, uh, various afflictive obscuring states uh, may or may not come into play, depending upon whether one finds the thing in question attractive or not attractive. Berna. Uh, and that's the level of passion and aggression, or wanting to possess or wanting to reject, reject uh, come into play. So in terms of the five sense perceptions and uh, the intellect, these six workings of uh, the worldly mindset. Uh, because of predispositions, uh, these processes happen and even though the object one is in contact with doesn't truly exist because of one's belief that it does truly exist, 
<coughs> the worldly individual becomes involved with his sentiments about the object, making for uh, likes and dislikes. And uh, so the advice here is, in terms of um, the text, which says apparent phenomena, all of them, are fabrications of the mind. Uh, the advice is, do not become involved with objects on the basis of the process that was just described. Uh, the process is uh, in many phases of the worldly mindset. Mm. Because it results in nothing but afflictive, obscuring states, and you enacting those, then uh, in that way um, accumulating more worldly predispositions that will make for suffering and so on. That's the point here. It's not about outer versus inner existence at all. Ah, that the intellectual gain is so so to yang. They come much of na. No, I didn't mean, but the chick comes at the sum, Matuna. Take a ping about it. So, how does one go about this? Well, as a practitioner, one makes use of the intellect because. Uh, as one is a beginner practitioner, one has not yet attained any level of realization where the intellect, at least to some extent, in its uh, conceptualizing of the world and so on, uh, have been overcome. As one is a person who uh, has a worldly mindset, it means uh, that one needs to work with the intellect, making use of the various methods uh, advised to practice in order to undo these processes that are mistaken. That is the intellect and the higher degree to which the practitioner intellectually understands that things are not as real as I used to believe, uh, the, the higher the d degree uh, on the part of the practitioner uh, will be in terms of overcoming afflictive obscuring states. Now, uh, a general intellectual knowledge here will not make it possible for a practitioner to overcome these processes these mistaken processes. Uh, this is uh, a path where the practitioner works with his intellect to the point where it's clear to, to the practitioner uh, in terms of knowledge, understanding and the like that how he previously perceived and interacted with objects of knowledge uh, that these perspectives uh, are mistaken, not valid. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one's understanding must be a profound one where there is insight of this, that one has previously been mistaken. And once that has been achieved, one can then use that level of intellectual knowledge in order to go even further. 
Mato cheke, cek gam jawi, tong bare, sam de gam da, tong bare shin do yot. Then jiki yot. For example, merely sit down on one's meditation cushion, perhaps frequently, thinking, I will now meditate on emptiness, uh, without the kind of uh, knowledge just described in brief. Uh, will just turn into another false idea about reality. Uh, in this uh, um, case, a false idea of what emptiness is. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that may make for attachment to the false idea of emptiness in the same way as if one looks at so-called Jida meditation where part of the meditation is to visualize oneself in the shape and form of the Jida perhaps with a specific color, with specific attributes and so on. Uh, to do so on the basis of not having properly uh, understood what was previously explained in terms of mind's processes. One simply sits on the meditation cushion uh, visualizing oneself as having a specific color, a specific shape, form and so on, uh, according uh, with a painting of a Yidam, if one reduces this type of meditation to just this, then again one will be uh, mistaken. And again, uh, uh, attachment to that shape of form and sh- form, sorry, uh, which one has visualized, uh, will result. And that's not at all what Jida meditation is about. In fact, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There are other meditation methods, uh, that of, for example, shamatha, resting in a calm state. Someone who makes use of uh, the methods available in the context of this type of meditation may achieve a mindset uh, of calm well-being and uh, some qualities which one previously did not have uh, may result. However, that alone uh, will not make it possible for the individual to sever the ties with samsara. Uh, One will not be able to, on this basis alone, uh, go beyond the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the answer to this question. There are some I got in the email. I have to open. Oh, I can't open the page here, but it has this. Oh dear. Uh, should I put in the details? I don't know how to do it even. Not good at computers. Uh, how odd. We, we Where do I write this? Continues to teach and I try to solve it. Yes. yes. Just one minute. We'll put in the Wi-Fi in my iPad. Yeah, then I read it. No. 
Maybe I can. Do I have it on the telephone? Yeah, it's sticky. Pardon? The Wi Fi is working. You just need your mailbox. But it won't open Safari, huh? I can't get into the email. How funny. Ah, now it opens, it seems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Where was it? Yes. One question is the following. Uh, in fact, this person asks two questions. The first question is the following. Uh -huh. Okay. The background of the question. In the teaching last week, sensation, the first moment of cognition, that is free of concepts, was discussed. It was presented as a kind of registering which is based on the characteristics of the sense organs of the being who registers, be it a human or a bee. That would mean that free of concepts is still bound by samsaric perception as the registering is determined by the kind of rebirth that one has, uh, that one has taken uh, and which is a result of karmic actions of previous lives. A being that has realized the nature of mind and all phenomena would then still have the same registering based on the sense organs of the respective rebirth. But that moment of registering would be characterized by knowing the nature of phenomena. It would thus be very different from the registering that samsaric beings have, although also both registerings are free of concepts. I'm asking because I may have had a wrong understanding of free of concepts. In the context of this first moment of registering, thinking of it more as untainted by samsaric processes, actual question. According to the teaching given, I now would understand the first moment of registering as also tainted by samsara because of it being bound and framed by the respective samsaric rebirth. Would that be correct? That thing is uncommon. Yes. That is that door do not have. To me, then to chini. Nye madi trenduse, to me se kente jikten le de pare. Da tanda kasang sung shavate den de mare, to me git sultu she par chavachik yupa mind ki, kase kuribo, sem ki tsingiore. To me git sultu. Tene gjik tem pe i shepa jin sarava to me de. Ta, to me gjik shepa sange, ta ta gjik tem pe i shepa re. Nga rën so kangal di ju arre. Yes, non-conceptual perception, as has been explained, is part and parcel of the worldly mindset. The Karcha take the Sena Tome Shepata, number Metope Yishini Parutala, Yoshematu. The problem here, um, in terms of understanding or the misunderstanding, is that this person and other people who have drawn a similar conclusion, uh, it's quite one has heard this before. Um, now um, has failed to understand that non-conceptual 
is not synonymous with um, what is popularly referred to as wisdom, uh, but in terms of the term used in Tibetan, uh, the translation would be primordial knowing or primordial knowledge. Mm. All sense perceptions are non-conceptual, all five. And all five non-conceptual sense perceptions are uh, uh, part and parcel of the worldly mindset. Whether one sees uh, a visual object, hears a sound, tastes a taste, uh, and so on and so forth, all these perceptions uh, are initially non-conceptual. Mm. However, uh, after the initial non-conceptual, or rather, the initial non-conceptual perception of an object uh, is followed by a conceptual perception of the object in question. Mm. Then, dasum chiktu zembe shepa. Da ten. Da ten ni. Da ten. Tene? Sumpa. Da. 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 Tanye. Tanye. Tene. Da dan tanye ni. Kaka kanji. Then, then, the rest is she go with your side. Then, koran yul koran. Yul tere. As was said, the initial non-conceptual perception is followed by conceptual perception, which uh, combines, as it were, uh, three perspectives uh, in terms of it forming a concept about the object. What are the three main ingredients, as it were? Well, it's the object itself, then there is its name, and uh, the sound produced when pronouncing the name. These are the three main factors which res in, in terms of uh, conceptual perception. And the intellect in terms of this process, so-called conceptual perception, fail to know that there are these three ingredients that result in a concept about the object. This is not understood at all by the worldly person. Uh, so the three are seen as one and the same thing, conceptually. The intellect sees or the conceptual working of the intellect at this point sees the three as just one thing. There is no knowledge or awareness of there being a number of factors that have produced the idea or concept that one has about the object. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Cambuchura shows on Kanangina. Tati, Sajitik and Nalanda, Karma be coquet on Ete, called Drat Coyoro. Drat Codu could talk at the country years now. Churras again, don't think it's of a pungo de la Coyoro. So, an example. Cambodian's name is Campbell Churdrak. He's associated with the Karmapa. Let's say that His Holiness the Karmapa wants to talk to Campbell Churdrak. So he tells his attendant, uh, please go and uh, tell Campbell Churdrak that I'd like to speak to him. What happens in the mind of the attendant? Well, when the sound waves of the words that His Holiness pronounces hit uh, the inner ear. Uh, that sense faculty non-conceptually registers the sound waves, uh, which affects, uh, which has the effect of uh, the intellect kicking in, uh, in a conceptual mo mode, uh, and in order to conceptually make sense of the sound heard, and the intellect uh, thinks of the person Kempo Chudrak, and then goes and gets him. Well, in fact, if we take if we take the 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 uh, um, what was just said, that part of uh, the perception, namely, uh, he goes and gets this person with the name Kempo Chudrak. Uh, he doesn't go and get someone else because the sound waves that translate into the name Kempo Chudrak in the mind of the perceiver uh, will identify this specific collection of innumerable subtle particles as Kempo Chudrak, even though there is neither a person, uh, actual person called Kempo Chudrak, nor anything else that has any real reality. There is simply uh, a collection of innumerable subtle particles in constant change. However, the conceptual working of the intellect of the attendant identifies this as a person called or known by, ne by the name Kempo Chodrak, and he goes and gets it. So it's a combination of sound waves, non-conceptually registered, that the intellect uh, translates into the name Kempo Chodrak, which uh, snowballs into the idea of this collection of subtle material particles being a person with that name, and the conceptual working of uh, or workings of the intellect here in terms of the attendant sees all three as the one and same thing. There is no awareness or knowledge of <laughs> there being these perspectives at all. There is just, oh, I'll go and get him. So, as a practitioner, one needs to understand all those details in terms of the workings of the mind in order to be able to get over all one's uh, mistaken ideas, concepts, and so on. You see, there are great benefits 
in developing an intellectual understanding of this to begin with, both in terms of in terms of the workings of the worldly mindset that include a non-conceptual phase and a conceptual phase, and both are uh, workings of uh, the worldly mindset. Uh, so what, what are the possible benefits? Well, Kempo Rinpoche continues with himself. His name is Kempo Chödrak. Uh, he's known uh, as uh, a scholar, uh, uh, someone who is highly achieved in terms of uh, Buddhist education and so on and so forth. Uh, now, a person who has achieved a lot uh, in his profession, uh, it happens very often that this person may uh, want to become well known, want to be well paid and so on and so forth uh, in consequence of his achievements. Now, the practitioner who has a good knowledge of the worldly mindset, both the non-conceptual and the conceptual perspectives, uh, would not concern himself uh, with for example, taking pride in achievements in his profession. Uh, why? Because he knows there is no... He intellectually knows, even though the knowledge is conceptual, he now has insight of the fact that he doesn't exist as a real person, and so on and so forth. And therefore, he sees that it's futile to take pride in his achievements, because as achievements, they do not truly exist. So what's the point in getting carried away about the achievements then? That is, some just simple lamb, lamb, and jina, tendege, young, young, the Lord, the chick, come to Mundi. Tamatella, come a young rabbi, may but live your A person on the path of a bodhisattva who practices the way that uh, has been described, uh, will develop in the right di direction and uh, become a person who is less and less concerned uh, with achievements, with reputation, uh, and the like. But then part of the topic left you. And in terms of the final stage of realization, at that point, uh, there is uh, no concern with those things, and there are no mistaken ideas about oneself as a real person and things other than oneself as real things, and so on and so forth. All this. Uh, is overcome. Jaisan, number me tokba singe dele. Number dra me da kari shan na yang tokba shubu me tu chaver. You see, it's it's a matter also of um, the tome. Number me took bala kaka ye go and do to me dang num par me took ba kaka penna ye go and do ya naranto sausage or be to me tens of kanga karcha dig to cheddar get me par top a tea with the wa may de tanda ke ye get draw tongue ne chick de lap tongue shame matiana num par me took ba dang took ba mepa Yeah. 
Sí. Solo si en Martín en que tuvimos un libro de seco que no. Ok. Nam par mi to parva. Nam pa chicla to que o marva. To pa me pase na. Yulio pa tsorne. Nam pa la migi o re da mare. Migi o re. Ten chik para wa cik. Si da chik para he da tenge tarangwa. Re, di na yang den so ngarang gyor go tu te. Sab sab ma che na ten re ge mara wa. Ya, ya. Ten e, wong che ngara wa. Nam par mi topa re tsa ne se ge o mare. Mare. Topa me pa. Ya, topa me pa se ge to. Nam pa che la mi ge o re te, nam pa te la mi ng che ta yo mare wa. Mare, mare. Digi ke pa re do wa. Te re te. You see, in terms of the English word non-conceptual, uh, you have to understand the following. It's, it's as very often um, on the part of, these, of, in the, of, of people who use these words in the English language. Uh, there may be a, uh, some lacking uh, a detailed knowledge of the workings of the language here. You see, in Tibetan, you refer to uh, non-conceptual, or the name for non-conceptual perception in the context of the five sense perceptions is Tokpa Mepa. Uh, and the word for conceptual perception is the word one would use is nampar tokpa. So you have the additional word nampa, which means perspective a reference to the fact that the conceptual mind, in terms of understanding an object, makes use of a name which it attaches to the thing, the object which the presence of which has been registered in the absence of naming it. Uh, which means that the perception is non-conceptual. There is simply the act of the mind registering the presence of something without naming it. And that is non-conceptual perception because there isn't the process of the sound waves of a name resulting in naming the thing in question and so on and so forth that conceptual perception of something involves. So, one could say to make it very, very uh, simple, uh, non-conceptual perception in terms of sense perceptions is about registering the presence of something without having any thoughts about it. Thoughts meaning concepts about it based in name the name of the thing, and so on and so forth. So that's how 
non-conceptual is defined, then you have conceptual, uh, which involves the name and so on. So it's a matter of the absence or presence of language in terms of the mental processes that relate to the object and how they relate to the object. Uh, just one. And in English too, concept or conceptual understanding involves language. So it's non-conceptual versus conceptual in terms of the two processes in the worldly mindset explained earlier that we've talked about. Uh, now, Kempo goes on to speak about that number me topa, Yeah. Uh, non-conceptual in terms of primordial knowing or so-called primordial knowledge. Did you? Did you? Number Kari Shanna Yang Shanna Tato Tell Toka Shui on a shoulder. And here non conceptual is explained according to that situation, which is different from the situation of or the workings of the conceptual intellect, because here, the, in terms of primordial knowing or primordial knowledge, popularly known as wisdom, the conceptual workings of the intellect have been overcome. So what is knowledge beyond the conceptual workings of the intellect? Well, it is ye she, ye ne shepa, uh, primordial knowing or primordial knowledge, popularly referred to as wisdom. And what happens here in terms of what non conceptual means here? Because we're now looking at a completely different type of knowledge and its working. Well, this kind of knowledge is non-conceptual, just as sense perception is. However, the workings of the non-conceptuality are different. Here, the moment the individual uh, is in context, with an object, being in contact with an object triggers in the realm of wisdom, as it were, recognition of the essencelessness, the emptiness of the object. So, the function of the conceptual intellect, which objectifies the object, has fallen away, doesn't happen anymore. The result of being in contact with an object is rather seeing its true nature. So the object does not impact this kind of knowledge in the same way as it impacts the worldly mindset. It triggers, the contact triggers knowledge of, direct knowledge of the essencelessness, the emptiness, the absence of a real reality in the object. And therefore, the individual who has achieved this level of knowledge doesn't give rise to afflictive, obscuring states and the like, ever. So 
you're looking at different ways of knowing, different functions of the mind. The worldly mindset and the other worldly mindset. And non-conceptual in terms of an otherworldly mindset is different from non-conceptuality in the context of the worldly mindset. But both are non-conceptual. It's just the way they are non-conceptual uh, is different. Or the workings of the non-conceptuality, as it were, are different. So it's not identical. The, these two are not identical, even though they have the same name. So, that was in the Yes, yes. 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 Uh, okay. Then the line a page you shall be. Yes. Uh, there are two more questions uh, which we will go through next time because Kemper Rimshi would like to give an example here in order to clarify a bit more about what has been explained. Perna Marbalosa Yagala Petin Tamatilla. Naropa, Jopal Petsarri. Kajes and the Kapu Gnel Petsarri is a girl. Yin a young Marbak let the Pashi which you as uncle so as a day, the Yaga Nomba Casa, Kalimba, Jungle the Chick Penne, Tamadaw Jag Samba. Jagger the Nasib Chembu, Jigan and Narab and Jay Song at Kunk. Jay do Marba Gata Chen Koran the Sertos and Nambior. The Pudre? Second a Pushat. Puberta Narabe Lama Kunjoche sent Sertorja to Kazakan. Marbe Semla. Ponsum to the Leverta. Necaleta has Javin Lame Yemas on Sons. Tid led in Narope, ya put Marba churn, then a tumpy serino, the shard and the deje, Sally Javada, tid sa do re, she can get any search household. Narope, Mola, Sergin number ten. Do you number any chamber? No one's the, the following example uh, is given. Marpa, the translator, on his last visit to India, having arrived there, was informed that Naropa, his guru, his main guru, uh, had left. And uh, there wasn't a single person who had any information as to the whereabouts of Naropa, which saddened Marpa greatly to the point where he just decided to go on foot to various regions in search of um, his master. He did so for eight, eight months and uh, at the end of this period, he actually encountered Naropa in a large forest somewhere. Uh, and he was overjoyed, of course, and he had brought with him from Tibet some gold that he had planned to offer uh, to uh, his master, uh, and which he did at one point, and Naropa took the gold in his hands and then just threw it into the air, uh, 
while pronouncing the words, I offer this to the three jewels. Now, Marpa had gone through quite some, uh, or had made quite some effort, or efforts rather, in order to be able to collect the gold to begin with and then bring it to India. And so, when his master threw the gold into the air and it fell far away <laughs> in different places, uh, I suppose there were many pieces of it, uh, he became slightly, he, he was unsettled uh, because he had anticipated, one presumes, this moment of making the offering to his Lama and perhaps in his mind uh, would have liked his offering to be more appreciated, who knows, <laughs> rather than the master throwing it into the air and it disappearing. Uh, uh, Naropa knew his thoughts, touched the ground, uh, and said to him, to me, all is gold. And it appears that the surroundings, the, the earth, the stones, the trees uh, of the area turned into gold. Uh, what can one learn from this? Well, one can learn from this that Naropa had attained the final level of realization uh, where the mindset no longer sees a difference between a regular stone and a piece of gold. Those distinctions as one having more value than the other, no longer happen simply. Uh, because he saw their true nature, their essencelessness, the essencelessness of the stone and that of the gold. And therefore, the workings of the mind that we're used to, namely appreciating one over the other and so on and so forth, simply do not happen in the minds of uh, individuals like Naropa. And that's what non-conceptual means in terms of that level of knowledge. So non-conceptual, the term, uh, may mean different things in relation to different types of knowledge. One should keep that in mind and not think that a single word will mean the same thing in each and every context. It's not the case. Now, uh, it's important to give detailed thought to what has been explained very briefly here today uh, and acquire knowledge that makes it possible for you to make progress. Uh, Kemperimshe says this year's summer course, which starts on the 5th of July, uh, during the three-week summer course, Kemperimshe will explain about uh, the two uh, basic types of meditation in Buddhism, shamatha and vipassana, uh, tranquility and insight. Uh, and there will be, uh, in the context of explaining these two types of meditation, explanations regarding uh, what has been explained uh, in today's session. So if you are interested in acquiring knowledge 
uh, about what was explained today, um, the recommendation would be to attend the summer course. Jetan de Zuk Tede Naranzo Ranju Le Tsunyam Yen Nanda. No one brought on condition to the Nyam Yen Nanda. Pinto Champion. And Missiva again. But Munson to Matona, intellectual correct in the summer town, the young, round Pinto Champion. One should understand that. Conceptual knowledge can be very constructive and very helpful in terms of making progress on the path to enlightenment. Uh, it, it, it's necessary to make use of the intellect uh, in order to learn about these various perspectives. Uh, there will be uh, great benefits in doing so uh, translating to progress in terms of one's efforts on the path to enlightenment. Lasso. Sunnam deya dam je zaiba nye tam ne nye be danam dam je je ga na je balav ju wa ye sik be zo len ru wa ju wa shu.